All right. Is it recording now? Yes, it is. Okay. So today is our fourth lecture in the series, and today we are going to foray slightly more advanced uh, into the arena of quantum computing, and we're going to talk about an example quantum algorithm. So we'll start doing something useful with quantum computers. But before we are able to discuss uh, a particular example of a quantum algorithm, and of course, I'm going to talk about the simplest example of a quantum algorithm. There are a few leftover ideas from quantum gates, especially the idea of two qubit quantum gates. So the first half of this lecture will be some beefing up uh, in to enabling us to understand how a particular quantum algorithm works. But if you remember, we finished our last discussion by a question. I threw a question in front of you and I promised that we'll take it up first thing in, in the lecture today. And the question is the following. I have a Hadamard gate, UH, which has a certain matrix representation, one over under root two, one, 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 minus one. And there's a certain truth table to this gate. And the truth table could always be expressed in the form of a table. I have an input and I have an output. If my input were ket zero, my output were ket zero plus one. And if my input were ket one, my output would be ket zero minus one. Now we would like to express this as a rotation on the block sphere. We know that every single qubit quantum operation that we can think of is a rotation on the block sphere. So no matter what technology that we use for quantum computers, it has to implement single qubit rotations. So let me draw the block sphere here. Okay. And the cardinal states are ket zero and ket one. And they live on the respectively the north and the south poles of the block sphere. Uh, of course, we have the x-axis, the nominal x-axis and the nominal y-axis. Uh, on the nominal x-axis, we the state that lives there is, is the superposition ket zero plus one over under root two. On the y-axis, the state that we have is ket zero plus iota ket one over under root two. So now with this definition of the block sphere, I asked the question, what kind of rotation is a Hadamard gate? So has anyone thought about this and does anyone have an answer to this question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, can you please identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Rank. Right. Um, yeah, so it's... Um rotation uh, around the y-axis by y over two. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another rotation around x-axis by y. By, by how much? Pi. By pi, okay. Yeah. So, so it's a sequence of two rotations. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So what you, what you mentioned is that I have a rotation about the y-axis. Uh, and a rotation which is followed by a rotation about the x-axis, correct? So let's see. So how how large is the rotation about the y-axis? Uh, by over two. By 90 degrees, okay. Uh, let's see. So if I took the initial state cat zero and I did a 90 degree rotation about the y axis, this state will land here, okay? This will come here. So it will traverse the Northern hemisphere, come down, come down, come down. And since it's a 90 degrees rotation, it's gonna stop here. And then I follow it up with a 180 degree rotation about the X axis, nothing happens, correct? Okay. Yeah. So, so this input state gives us the correct answer. So let's look at the second input state. 
if this was my initial state, the cat one uh, state, and I did a 90 degree rotation about the y axis, this is my y axis. Then I would go around the back of the block sphere on the southern hemisphere and end up here, uh, which is the minus x axis, which is and then I follow it with the 180 degree rotation about the orange axis, nothing happens because this state is on the orange axis. So nothing happens. So, so we are good. So we are good. So it seems that your definition of having two consecutive rotations, one along the x, y axis, followed by one along the x axis and through 180 degrees along the x axis seems to be correct. Now let's look at another input state. If I were to input cat zero plus cat one over under root two into the Hadamard gate, what should my output be? My output should be cat zero. Okay. So if so, this Hadamard gate could take any input that you that your little heart desires. And it, it should give you the correct output. So if I were to give this input, the Hadamard gate, an ideal Hadamard gate should give me, give me cat one as the output. Uh, I hope you're with me on this. So let's see if your proposed rotations give us the correct output. So if I started off with a state that lies along the X axis, a 90 degree rotation will take me to cat one. Okay, and then I have a 180 degree rotation about the x axis. I will go around this large circle, this big circle, and get onto cat zero. So your answer is correct. These two rotations, back to back rotations, do qualify as a proper Hadamard gate. So I can do, so if I can just represent my rotation in the following fashion, I have a rotation through 90 degrees about the Y axis, followed by a rotation about the X axis through 180 degrees. Then this set of rotations is equal to the Hadamard gate. Now, thank you, your answer is perfectly correct. Just having a 90 degree rotation about the y axis will not give you the correct answer because it's not going to work for this can this uh, this transformation. This transformation will not work if I just considered the 90 degree rotation about the y axis. Now the next question is uh, probably you would like to answer this question as well. Now I have two back to back rotations. Can I somehow convert this into a single rotation, just one rotation about one axis. Is it possible? Yes, it should be possible. Yes, so what should be the axis of rotation for just a single rotation? It should Something be the eigenvalue or the eigenvector, sorry, of the uh, matrix, the Hadamard matrix. Right, so what, what is the eigenvector? What direction is it going to point in? It's one minus the uh, square root two oh, and one. Uh, no, it's uh, it's going to be slightly different, I think. So let me let me propose what the axis of rotation is going to be. But you're absolutely correct. You need to find an eigenvector of the Hadamard gate. If I were to take an axis of rotation which really is, so let me, this is my X axis and this is my Y axis. And these have nothing to do with position. The X and Y doesn't represent position here. It's just a labeling of the block sphere. And if I were to define an axis of rotation, this axis, so red is my axis of rotation, which is in the X, Z plane, And this is at an angle of 45 degrees in the XZ plane. 
And if I were to do a 180 degree rotation about this axis, I would get a Hadamard gate. So just consider this state cat zero. If this is my initial state, and I move around this axis of rotation, which is now a tilted axis of rotation. My axis of rotation need not be in the equatorial plane. It could be along Z axis, it could be along X axis, Y axis, and so on. So if I did a 180 degree rotation about the X axis, I would move in a cone like this. And I will end up at cat X, which is cat zero plus one over under root two. And if this were my initial state, if cat X were my initial state, I did a rotation of 180 degrees about the red axis, I will move in the same cone and get back to cat zero. So this is a tilted cone and the cone is such that the red axis lies at the vertex of the cone. So if I were to draw this in a slightly from a different perspective, this is my cone here. <coughs> the red axis, which is the axis of rotation, passes through the center of the cone. And since I'm looking at the same rotation from a different perspective, this is my Z axis. This is my get X axis. So the Hadamard gate is really a rotation about the uh, a tilted axis of rotation, and it's a rotation about the about an axis <clears throat> which is in the x z plane, and it's a rotation through an angle of one eighty degrees. So I can also represent this rotation operator, the Hadamard gate U H, by a rotation through one eighty degrees about an axis which is now uh, is now between so let let's call it x plus z over under root 2 so instead of having an x or y i now have an x plus y over under root 2 so this subscript identifies the axis of rotation and this argument in the bracket identifies the amount of rotation So, so much for single qubit operations. Every single qubit operation is a rotation operator. And if we were to build a quantum computer, this is an essential requirement, an ingredient for all quantum computers. You need to implement single qubit gates or single qubit rotations, because otherwise you will not be able to transform your input states. Every information processing task, which is called computing, requires an input, then you do a certain transformation, a series of logic gates, and, and you get an output. So a quantum computer must, uh, must really satisfy this uh, property. Now, if we just had a single qubit, we would not be able to do anything useful. Therefore, we generally talk about multi-qubits. And when we start talking about two qubits, things get really, really interesting. And then you should be able to do something useful. With a single qubit, it turns out that you can just simulate a quantum computer using a classical computer. If there are no correlations between qubits, just single qubits on their own, it does not remain any interesting. Of course, uh, the, uh, of course uh, the concept of superposition and entanglement is interesting. But uh, really, you need access to two qubits at least. So let's talk about two qubits now. Any questions about single qubit operations? OK, so let's move on. Now, suppose when I was drawing the quantum networks or the quantum circuits, I drew lines some unitary operator and an input state and an output state. So these lines represent qubits. So this is a qubit in an input state and an output state. And the box represents a quantum gate. 
Now I could also have the following scenario. I have, I may have two qubits coming in and a certain gate u1 acts on the first qubit and a certain gate acts on the second qubit and each qubit is then transformed. Suppose my first qubit is in a state cat 0 and my second qubit is also in a state cat 0. So these could be two photons or two spins or two squids or two whatever you're talking about, two degrees of freedom. Uh, and these qubits also interact with one another. And we're going to discuss this in a minute. Now we know that a single qubit is just represented by say cat psi and I'm looking at a particular state cat zero. My second qubit, so this is my first qubit and this is my second qubit. Now I need to have an organized way of writing a two qubit quantum state. Okay, so what I normally do is I put the first qubit in the first position and the second qubit in the second position as I've done over here on the screen and I put this symbol in between. So it's a cross with, which is encircled. In mathematics, such a symbol represents what is called a tensor product. <clears throat> so what I've written over here is, is a two qubits. Each qubit lives in its own Hilbert space. It has its own block sphere representation. The other qubit has its own block sphere representation. And the two qubits together, they form a higher dimensional system. So in shorthand, I could just remove the tensor product sign and write it in this fashion, cat zero followed by cat zero. And it's understood that the first position goes to the first qubit and the second goes to the second qubit. I can even be lazier. And if I'm even more lazy, I can just write the two states in a single cat, cat zero, zero. So now if I have two qubits, uh, what is the dimensionality of the system? If I have a single qubit, I need a basis with two vectors, cat zero and cat one. If I have two qubits, I need a basis which has four basis four. states. Yeah, <clears throat> so they will be cat 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And any state that I can write for two qubits, psi, still given the general symbol psi, will be a superposition of these four basis states. All right, now I also need to constrain this. Uh, I need to constrain these coefficients. Remember, all four of them are complex coefficients and the probabilities need to be conserved once again. So I have the condition that C naught naught square plus C naught one square plus C one zero square plus C one one square must be equal to one. I can have n qubits. So this, these are two qubits states, right? And there will be two raised to, so if I had n qubits, remember that if you want to do something useful, you need to have somewhere of the order of a hundred qubits in a quantum computer. A quantum computer that has more than 50 qubits is generally considered to be breaking the quantum ascendancy limit. So you need a large number of quantum of qubits to do something useful. So if I add n qubits and the basis states, suppose I represent them with cat i, then there will be a coefficient c i with each cat i and I need to take the sum over all i's and there will be two raised per n such states, okay? So this is the general form of an n qubit quantum state. Okay, so far so good. And then <coughs> another interesting thing. 
have a two qubit state 0 1 okay if I were to express this in matrix notation in the form of a column vector what would I do 0 1 is nothing but the tensor product of cat 0 and cat 1 I know that cat 0 is represented by a column vector with 1 and 0 and cat 1 is represented by a column vector 0 and 1 and if I form the mathematical tensor product which I do in the following fashion I take this one and multiply it with 0 and multiply it with 1 I get 0 1 and then I take the second entry 0 and multiply it in the same order with 0 and 1 this becomes my vectorial representation of a two qubit state cat 0 1 and I can do this for all the basis states so that I have four basis states 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 and each one of them remember that these four strings 0 0 are just like what we are accustomed to dealing with in, in normal computers so you need two qubits to have four different kinds of strings with three qubits you can have eight different kinds of string and the nice thing is that you can have all of the basis states in parallel and that is where you get the power from you get the power from quantum parallelism and we're going to look at an example of this kind so zero zero will be represented as one zero 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 one will be represented in this fashion zero could be represented in this fashion and one one could be represented in this fashion and any state so if i were to take this state that i've written over here this thing okay what i would do is simply this cat psi will simply be c not c1 c not not c not 1 c1 not c11 four complex coefficients as the four entries of the complex vector <clears throat> oh, so far so good any questions here up till this point now let me look at a particular two qubit quantum gate an example Let me first draw the draw the uh, circuit diagram for a two qubit quantum gate. I have one qubit. Okay, this gate is called a controlled phase gate. And I define the controlled phase gate through a certain truth. So I have two inputs, two qubits coming in. This is the first qubit and the bottom one I identify as the second qubit. And there are four basis states. So I can define four basis states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. I need to define the action of the controlled phase gate. <coughs> the action of the controlled phase gate is that the first qubit acts as a control and the second qubit acts as a target. If the first qubit is cat 0, cat 0, then nothing happens to the overall state. So I get 0, 0, 0, 1. If the first qubit is cat 1 and the second qubit is cat 0, still nothing happens. However, if the first qubit is cat1 and the second qubit is also cat1, the overall state picks up a phase, EI phi. So this is my definition of a controlled phase gate. Okay. 
Now, could anyone tell me out of the top of your head, if I were to write a matrix for this control phase, okay, let's do five. Uh, remember that there is some correlation between the state qubit. The what happens to the state depends upon what, what on the first qubit. So there has to be some correlation, and that correlation is represented by by this line over here. The first qubit is talking to the second qubit. This is an example of a correlation some kind of entanglement we'll talk about entanglement later but there is some kind of link a quantum link between the two qubits and you need to have this interaction as it is generally called by physicists you need to have an interaction between qubits to do something useful if you had a thousand qubits and none of them interacted with one another so this is just like having thousand independent single qubit quantum computers they would do nothing useful for you you need to have some interaction between the qubits. Okay, and this is vital, <laughs> remember. So this is a, a two qubit, a, a genuine two qubit quantum gate because what happens to one qubit depends upon the state of the first qubit. Now on the top of your head, could you tell me that if I were to write a matrix for this quantum gate, every quantum gate admits a matrix representation. First of all, what is the size of this matrix? Four by four. Four by four. Four by four. Four by four. And what are the entries? Can I it's ask? It's almost that? like. What are the entries of this matrix? One it's zero. Wrong. Sorry. One, one zero zero zero. zero. Hmm. Zero one zero zero. Zero zero one zero. Zero, 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 e to i five. Exactly. And you can work it out that this is indeed the correct matrix representation for a controlled phase gate. It's a diagonal matrix. And diagonal matrices, by the way, are very easy to deal with because it's easy to multiply diagonal matrices. All right. One more example. If my phase were pi, okay, so... I have a controlled phase shift gate or a controlled pi gate in which the phase is pi, then my matrix would simply be one, 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 minus one with zeros everywhere else, okay? So this is an example of a controlled uh, pi gate. And these are really important in quantum computing. The last gate that I would like to mention is of the following kind. And we're going to use this in the quantum algorithm that we're going to discuss today. This is an example of a C naught or a controlled not gate. And there was a question yesterday asked by a friend and she mentioned about the universal set of gates. So if I have single qubit operations and a controlled not gate, I can build any multi qubit quantum computer. So I need that can implement at least a single qubit operation and at least a controlled not gate. Now the property of the control not gate is very straightforward. It just, so uh, once again, it's a two qubit gate. So I identify the four input basis states. Zero, zero goes to zero, zero, nothing happens. Zero, one goes to zero, one, nothing happens because the, the uh, control qubit is zero. If the control qubit is one, it inverts the target qubit. And if the control qubit is one, it inverts this Z one and it makes it go into one zero. <coughs> so this is the truth table for a control not gate. So what happens to the second qubit depends upon what is the state of the first qubit. Now, this is really important. And of course, this would require an interaction between the two qubits. Now, my good friends, I know you can just tell me what the matrix 
control not gate is going to look like any brave soul just speak up what is the matrix going to look like so there is a zero, shortcut zero. way all right zero zero one, zero 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 yeah no zero 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 one so you want one here what? and a no, zero zero no no you don't want this no this is not what we no. desire one zero so zero, for zero. your convenience yeah exactly one zero 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 then second row zero one zero zero mm -hmm. third row uh, zero 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 one exactly fourth row zero and zero one zero one zero one zero so exactly zero, one, zero. exactly so one zero. If, exactly so so nothing happens to to this block here this block remains the same because this is the block which is applicable when the first qubit is zero. But when the first qubit is one, which is the sec third column and the fourth column, do I get an inversion of roles, an inversion of kinds? So, and, and you do, do a shortcut equation. So the first column represents the this output, which is zero, zero. The second column represents this output, zero, one, right? So this is just the, this column is just the vectorial representation of cat zero, one. The third column represents the output for the third basis state, which is cat one, one. And likewise, this is represented by the fourth column. So this is a shortcut way of remembering how to construct matrices. All right, so now that we, we have in our recipe book, different kinds of quantum gates, let's talk about a quantum algorithm, the simplest of them. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, well, before going further, uh, at the first of the lecture, you said about tensor product column of two vectors, but I think um, column two of two vectors cannot be multiplied by each other. Right, so this is not normal multiplication. This is tensorial multiplication. Uh, of course, if I have a column vector, A, B, I cannot multiply it with C, D, these. Yes. So, however, I can do a tensor product. And what a tensor product does is that it raises the dimensionality of the system. So this is a two dimensional vector. This is a two dimensional vector. I get a new Hilbert space, a new space, which is now four dimensional. And if I were to take the tensor product, this A will be multiplied with C, I get AC. A will be multiplied with D, AD, BC and BD. So this is a tensor multiplication. This raises the dimensionality of the system. Okay, this is not normal multiplication. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about an algorithm and we're going, this is our first real example of seeing, even though we did see in quantum interferometer that quantum effects can be really weird. This is our first example of looking at the power of quantum computers. And we will exploit the concept of superpositions and what is called quantum parallelism. Now there's a lot of raging debates between experts on why are quantum computers powerful? Some say it's the concept of superposition, some say it's parallelism, some say it's entanglement, some reality. some people say it's a combination of, of two or three or more of these characteristics. So there is no consensus on what really is, uh, what makes it so powerful, but Everyone knows, especially the computer scientists who would like to make quantum computers put to good use, know that it helps us solve problems which are polynomially hard in a with a linear amount of resources. 
you don't need a, an exponentially large number of resources to solve your problem. And that is why there's so much promise around quantum uh, computers. But then there are other aspects of quantum information which make these quantum concepts really useful for quantum communication. But let's look at our first simplest example. Suppose I have, by the way, the algorithm that we're going to talk about, sorry, is called the Deutsch algorithm. All right, uh, before, uh, I just forgot one thing. Uh, suppose my first qubit is in the state cat zero and my second qubit is in a superposition state. <clears throat> say, say, just an example. So this is my first qubit and all of this is the state of it. Okay, and there's a tensor product between the first and the second qubit. Okay, so this is a legitimate state. What I could always do using the linearity principle, I could write this as zero, zero, plus one over under root two EI phi zero one. Okay. So just remember this small point. Now this phase, even though it appears with the second qubit here in this way of writing the two qubit state, it's in fact prepended to this basis state zero one, which belongs to both qubits. So we really need to keep this concept in mind. Okay. <coughs> now suppose I have a function f, okay? And this function acts on a qubit and gives me a certain output, all right? So let me, suppose I function zero. So there are two possible states, a single, Okay, let's talk about bits. Instead of qubits, let's talk about numbers, just zeros and ones, Boolean logic, okay? So I can have a function that acts on zero and the output could also be binary, so zero. And it acts on one and the output is still zero. Okay? How many different kinds of functions can I write? So this is one of them. So I'm going to write down functions which take in a bit and take a bit as an output, okay? So the second kind of function is the following. Two input states, zero can go into one, one can go into one. Then I can have the following, zero, one. Zero goes to zero and one goes to one, then I can have zero goes to one and one goes to zero. All right, so there are four different kinds of functions. Now the top two functions Let's call them a constant function. So this is a constant function. No matter what the input is, the output is always zero. Likewise, no matter what the input is, the output is always one. <coughs> All right. So the first two functions that I've written at the top, in the top row, they are examples of a constant function. Okay. The bottom functions, however, are of a different kind. Let's call them balanced functions. Okay. The two examples in the bottom row, they are examples of balanced functions. So here, these are balanced functions. Whereas at the top, I have constant functions. All right, so I hope this is clear. Uh, 
So just imagine a coin. A coin can have, a coin always has two sides. Now there's heads on one side and tails on the other side. If we have minted such a coin, which has heads on one side and tails on another side, this is a balanced function. I look at head, I look at one side, I get heads. I flip it over. I look at the other side of the coin, I get tails. I can declare and announce that the coin is balanced. It has heads on one side and tails on the other side. Okay, so this is an example of a balanced function. However, if a special coin is minted in the mint and I look at one side of the coin, okay, and I say, oh, it's heads. And then I do another experiment. I flip it over and see the other side of the coin and it's still heads. I say that this coin is imbalanced or constant. I could also see tails on both sides. Now, in order to determine whether coin is balanced, that is, it is fair or it is constant, which is unfair. I need to do two experiments, correct? First of all, I need to find the function f. <clears throat> I need to find the function f acting on zero. And then I need to perform another function of f acting on one. <coughs> so I need to find out the answer for this. And I need to find out the answer for this. So I need two evaluations classically. I cannot determine in one go by one evaluation whether the function that I'm talking about f is balanced or crossed. I promise that the function is either balanced or constant. But in order to find out the answer to this promise, I need to do two evaluations. Okay, first I need to find what happens when f acts on zero and what happens when f acts on one. So is this clear? So this is my problem statement. Can I design a quantum computer which tells me whether the function is constant or balanced just using one experiment in one go? Instead of doing two different experiments, I, want, I would like to do this experiment in one go. So this is my problem and I Deutsch algorithm, which was one of the earliest algorithms devised helps us do that. So do you understand the problem statement? One or two yeses on the chat box will give me some satisfaction that, okay, we're on the right track here. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Now what I would like to do, <clears throat> do you know what, what is an exclusive OR gate? So if I were to draw the truth table for an exclusive OR gate, so Mohammed Ayaz says yes, okay. So if I were to draw the truth table for an exclusive OR gate, so classically, this is what the exclusive OR gate looks like. You have two inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So two inputs, there are four possible strings and the output. So here are the inputs and here are the outputs. Zero, 0, gives me zero, 0, at the output, 0, 1. So nothing happens to the first, to the first bit, okay? However, the second bit changes and it changes if either of the two inputs are one. So this will give me one. And sorry. Uh, so the output is one if either of the first bits is, is one. So this is the truth table for an exclusive OR gate. 
okay so what we would like to do now is we would like to solve this problem using a quantum computer the problem of determining whether function is constant or balanced and we'll employ a quantum exclusive or gate so let's see how 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 we do this let me first draw the circuit diagram for for this algorithm <clears throat> Two qubits. Now, sub, I have one qubit only, right? So I need to determine the the whether the function when it acts on a single bit gives me a constant or a balanced. However, in order to solve this problem, I from my own side add a second qubit, which is generally called an ancillary qubit. <laughs> All right. Two qubits coming in. And I'll explain everything. So don't don't worry. And then I have a two qubit gate, which acts on both qubits. Let's call this gate UF. And I'll define what this gate does. <laughs> okay, so let's go step by step. Now, this is my circuit for implementing the Deutsch algorithm. Now let me explain all the all the steps in it. I have two qubits, qubit one here, qubit two here. And I initialize my quantum computer in a particular fashion. My first qubit is cat zero. And my second qubit is initialized as cat one. I need to know what my initializations are. Then I have a Hadamard gate on the first qubit and a Hadamard gate on the second qubit. And then what I have is a controlled function evaluation. Remember the examples that we discussed earlier? We have a controlled, this is a controlled not gate. So I can represent this controlled not gate as a big bl black box, okay? Likewise, I had a controlled phase gate. This is also a big black box that acts on both qubits and I need to define a truth table for this controlled gate. So, so this is a controlled function evaluation. And what is the truth table for this function evaluation? That is the following. What this gate does is, so the properties of this gate are the following. So let me write f of zero. f of one I'm defining a truth table so remember if I have zero with anything anything here and I do an exclusive or <clears throat> What do I get? Zero. The exclusive or with, so if I add a zero here, the exclusive or of zero with zero, I would get zero. The exclusive or of zero with one, I would get one. The exclusive or of one with zero. So when I do have an exclusive or with anything, my answer is anything. 
So if if I write down the truth table, okay, in a simplified fashion for exclusive or zero 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 one one zero one one. Sorry, just ignore. Sorry, this I I think I've made a mistake over here. I need to have one output. Sorry, sorry about that. So this is my a first input, second input, and this is a exclusive or with b. Okay, so this is my definition for an x or. Zero zero gives me zero as the output. Zero one gives me one at the output. One zero uh, gives me one at the output, and one one gives me zero at, as the output. Okay, so this is the truth table for an exclusive or. So if I have zero with anything, the answer is that anything, right? Zero goes here. One goes here. But this is not true if my first cube state bit is in the state one. The second qubit is inverted if my first state is one. Okay, so zero goes to one and one goes to zero. Okay, so this is the truth table for an exclusive OR. For an exclusive OR gate, the output is one only when the two inputs are orthogonal to one another. Okay, so this is how we define an exclusive OR gate. So the outputs are one, which are these two cases when the two inputs are orthogonal to one another. That is, one of them is zero and the other is one. If both of them are zero or both of them are one, which are the first and the fourth row, my output is going to be zero. All right. So any uh, questions about or confusions about this exclusive OR gate? Now let's define what is UF. What does UF do? Now UF is a two qubit gate, yes. Okay, there's something one in the chat. So, any confusion? Uh, is the answer no? All right, so the, the answer to this question is yes. Okay. Now, if you look at the function evaluation, the controlled function evaluation, it has two outputs, two inputs two qubit inputs and two qubit outputs. Okay. So I need to have two inputs. So I have zero, zero. <clears throat> so what does the exclusive OR get? So I have zero, zero as the input. I have one possible input, zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So my output is going to be the following. So nothing happens to the first qubit. The control qubit doesn't change. However, the second qubit changes. And let me define how the second qubit changes. <clears throat> the second qubit changes in the following fashion. I take the second qubit zero and find its exclusive or with the function evaluation on the first qubit. Okay. Likewise, for this input state, I take the second qubit, the state of the second qubit and find the exclusive or on the function evaluation of the first qubit. Likewise here, I take the second qubit and find the function evaluation on the first qubit. Likewise, I take the second qubit and find the function evaluation on the first qubit. Okay. So nothing happens to the first qubit. The first qubit is preserved. Whereas the second qubit, you exclusive or XOR the second qubit's state with the function evaluation on the first qubit. And if I were to write this in shorthand, get X, get Y under the UF function, nothing happens to the first qubit. And for the second qubit, you take the exclusive or of Y with FX. Okay, so this is the general way of, of writing how we have designed our controlled function evaluation. By the way, the exclusive OR is also called addition modulo two. 
So I add zero plus zero, answer is zero. Zero plus one, answer is one. One plus zero, answer is one. One plus one is two, and modulus two, two equals zero in the binary system. Okay. So this is my definition for UF. And remember, if I were to take the exclusive or of zero with anything, the answer is anything. So I can just the exclusive or so here. The exclusive or of zero with f of zero will simply be the answer will simply be f of zero. Likewise, in this answer, the exclusive or <coughs> of zero with function evaluation of one will simply be f of one. Okay. Now, uh, if I were to complete this thing here, so so I need to know. What is one? I need to know these things for various values of f zero and f one. Let me just finish. So, so I write one exclusive or f zero, and one exclusive or with f one here, and I need to complete this truth table. So f zero could be zero one. <coughs> f one could also be zero one. So if so, so let me just complete this truth table. Can you help me complete this truth table, please? So what should I write over here? If my f zero is zero, what is f exclusive or with f zero? What should I write over here? I think should write one. Should I write one or zero? One. One. What should I write here? Zero. Zero, because one model one exclusive or one is one zero. So here, one. It will be one. And here I should write zero. Okay. So I need to keep this truth table in my mind. Okay. So this is at the back of my mind. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, shouldn't it be uh, f of one and f of zero? So I'm. I, I need to find out what happens when <clears throat> I XOR one with f of zero and one with f of one. So here I have captured all the possibilities. So exclusive or zero with anything is the the other thing. So I just yes. look at what I really need over here. Okay, the truth table has more entries, but I, I'm not concerned with them at the moment. Okay. Okay. So let's let's move on to the quantum algorithm, and things will get clearer. Let me redraw the circuit because I would need it. Hadamard gate, first qubit. Hadamard gate on the second qubit. Then my function evaluation, which I've defined the truth table for uf, and then I just ignore the second qubit. I put it in the dustbin. So this is just my cartoonic representation of not looking at this output. I don't care what this output is, because I'm using the second qubit just as a, as an ancillary, just as an aid, just as something that assists me. I need to look at the first qubit. I put a Hadamard gate again. And I look at what the output is. Okay, so this is my quantum circuit. Sorry, I may, may have missed the Hadamard gate over here. Okay, my initial states are cat zero and cat one. So let's go step by step. First of all, I'm interested in knowing what my state is going to be here. Okay, let's call this two qubit state cat psi one. So my input state is cat zero. Sorry, let me change the color. My input state is cat zero, cat cat one, right? 
so i'm just writing i'm just not writing the tensor product i just ignore it okay and it's understood that this is a two qubit state so what happens after uh acting on the first qubit and uh acting on the second qubit so i can also write this as a tensor product this gate is this is a tensor product of two two matrices in other words i would like to find out what is my psi 1 what is the state over here the green area now the first hadamard gate acts on the first qubit the second hadamard gate acts on the second qubit okay and the two qubits apparently they are not correlated with one another i have two independent qubits one gate is a single qubit gate acting on the first qubit the hadamard gate is a single qubit gate acting on the second qubit so i can do the two operations independently side by side so get 0 becomes 0 plus 1 over under root 2 <clears throat> no uh, you know we've just defined the exclusive or gate in in this fashion okay get 0 becomes after the hadamard gate 0 plus 1 and let me reintroduce it then sub product for clarity the second qubit get one, this thing goes to zero minus one over under root two. <coughs> okay. Now this is my state psi one. Now let me expand this. So one over under root two multiplied with itself gives me half. And let me simplify this or expand this out. Zero, zero, I can write as zero, zero, so this is zero being tensored with get zero. Now I would like to tensor zero with this one over here, okay? So with the minus sign. So I have to preserve these phases. So I get zero one. Then what I would like to do, I would like to take this one and write it together with the second qubit state plus one zero. And likewise, I would do it for this. So get minus one one. I close the brackets. Simple algebra like looking manipulation, even though these are quantum states. Now I have this two qubit quantum state, a general two qubit quantum state. What I would like to do now, next, the uf acts on this, okay? And I would go over here. I would like to find the state over here. Let's call this state psi 2. I've de I have defined what is the action of U, UF, okay? <clears throat> so one half, nothing happens to one half. Let's see what happens when I have get zero. Uh, so nothing happens to the first qubit. So I write a big bracket, these big brackets. Nothing happens to the first qubit. What happens to the second qubit? I take the second qubit and exclusive or it with the function evaluation on the first qubit. So zero, zero, I, I have to write this thing here, this thing, okay? So this becomes f of zero. Okay, now this f of zero could be zero or one and we don't know it beforehand. This is what we would like to evaluate, whether the function is constant or balanced. This becomes zero, nothing happens to the first qubit and I would write one plus exclusive or f of zero. Okay. So zero one, this is the second entry here. One plus exclusive or f of zero. Then the third thing, nothing happens to the first qubit. <clears throat> this becomes f of one. Then one, one exclusive or f of 1. So this is my output. All right. So any, any confusions up to this point? Any, any confusions? All 
right so 30 minute 30 second rule no responses which means everything is presumably clear all right now let's look at the truth table that we made earlier so notice the following i have f0 here and 1 plus exclusive or when i say plus it means exclusive or 1 plus f of 0 now 1 plus what is the value of 1 plus f of 0 mm, where is my truth table now 1 plus f of 0 could be 1 or 0 okay it is 1 if f of 0 is 0 and it is 0 if f of 0 is 1. So this answer, can I write this answer in shorthand in the following fashion? Uh, okay, let me go back here. F Notice there is a minus sign over here. Notice this. Can I write this thing over here in the following fashion? All right, food for thought. <clears throat> I have a phase factor minus one whose power is f of zero. Suppose my f of zero is zero. Let's look at the first row over here. If my f of zero is zero, then my one plus f of zero is one. So if my f of 0 is 0, then that is this number is 0. If this number is 0, then 1 plus f of 0 is going to be equal to 1. Okay. And if this is the case, then my the orange thing the, what i put braces around would become cat zero cat zero minus cat zero cat of one and i can do the reverse simplification the reverse uh, manipulation i could write this as a tensor product of the first qubit which is always zero and take the tensor product with the second qubit which is one okay and my coefficient has to be plus one. So my f of zero is zero. So minus one raised to the power zero is plus one. So this thing turns out to be equal to one. However, if my f of zero, which is over here, uh, where is it gone? If I consider this row, if my f of zero is one, then my one plus f of zero is going to be zero. Then let's see what's going to happen. The second scenario. In the second scenario, f of, if f of zero is one, which I'm putting in green, then my one plus f of zero is going to be zero. Now, what does the orange <clears throat> combination of states looks like? It looks like zero, one, minus zero get zero and then I, if I were to do the reverse simplification I would take factorize of the first qubit I would get get one minus get zero and I could do a further sim uh, simplification of writing this as the tensor product of get zero with zero minus one but I need to take into account that I'm reversing the order so I need to put a minus sign here 
and that minus sign is being captured by this global phase minus one with an exponent of f of zero. All right, so the first two terms I've taken care of. The first two terms are written in this general form. Likewise, if I were to repeat the same argument for <clears throat> the third and the fourth terms, then the third and the fourth terms will look like the following. The first qubit is in the state cat one, <clears throat> and the second qubit is in the state zero minus one, and I need to put in this factor minus one, and I exponentiate this with the function evaluation on the all right so i i can now put everything together and this i think you should do as a homework on your own this may look complicated at, uh, for the time being but once you do it everything is going to work out you just need to keep an eye on on this truth table over here that we've drawn now the state side two after the function evaluation turns out to be one half get zero tensor product with z minus one over under root two minus one raised to power f of zero <coughs> plus get of one get zero tensor product zero minus one over under root two with the phase factor minus one raised to the power f of one. Okay. And you could do pretty neat things to this. What you, sorry, uh, I can put a one over and root two here. So the second qubit is in the state zero minus one over under root two. So I can factorize out the second qubit. Okay, just like you do factorization in normal algebra. Whereas the first qubit is in the following state. One over under two in the denominator, minus one f raised to the power zero, cat zero, plus minus one raised to the power f of one, cat one. So this is my first qubit. This is my second qubit. I'm going to redraw the circuit here because I don't want to scroll up again. Hadamard gate on the first qubit. Hadamard gate on the second qubit. The first qubit was initialized as cat zero, the second as cat one. Then I have a function evaluation, uf. And the state over here is psi two. This is my state psi two over here. Now this turns out to be pretty, pretty neat because the second qubit is independent. It has been factorized out uh, it's, and we don't care about it. We can just throw it away, throw it away. It becomes a don't care condition, throw it away. However, it was needed for the actual function evaluation. Now look at the first qubit. <clears throat> this is the state of the first qubit. If F0 is the same as F1. So if F0 is the same as F1, then my first qubit is minus one, zero plus one over under root two. Okay, so if my function is constant, this is the state of the first qubit. If, however, the function is balanced, which means f0 and f1 are not the same, then what is the state of the first qubit? The state of the first qubit, depending upon depending upon what is f0 and f1, I can get, so if f0 is 1, I would get minus 0 plus one or zero minus one. 
and I can always write this first combination. I can take minus as common. I can write this first combination as zero minus one. And I can ignore this global phase. Now I'm just looking at the first qubit. I'm just seeing here. This is my eyes focused here. My measurement apparatus is here. So depending upon whether the first, so let me redraw the, fir the first qubit. So this, this is my first qubit coming out of, out of UF. I don't care about the second qubit. So my first qubit is zero plus one over under root two or zero minus one over under root two. And this is the scenario when I have a constant function. And this is a scenario whether I have a balanced function. Now, is it possible to do a one shot measurement? My last question to you, can I do a one shot measurement? Just look at this output once and determine whether the function is constant or balanced. How would I do that? I need to do a measurement. How do I distinguish between zero plus one and zero minus one? In other words, because if the function is constant, I get cat zero plus cat one. And if the function is balanced, I get cat zero minus one. Now, how do I perform a measurement, which is the last stage in, a, in any quantum computation? How do I perform a measurement to distinguish or discriminate between these states? Using phase. Using? Phase. Yeah, so so I, I have phase of zero okay. is constant and phase of one is balance. So if I give you if I give you a quantum state which is either zero plus one or zero minus one, and I ask you to determine which state is it, how would you do that? I have a detector which can detect zeros and ones or, or polarizing beam splitter, for example. It can separate out states, but how do I discriminate between Run. the states? Ron said a chat uh, use another Hadamard plate. Exactly. So who was that? Uh, uh, Ron Gibrin. No, Ron said it at, at, at chat. Very good. Very good. So what you would do is you would use a Hadamard gate here. Another Hadamard gate here. On the first qubit, you put a Hadamard gate over here. Right? A Hadamard gate over here. Or here. So what this Hadamard gate does, the last Hadamard gate, which is just acting on the first qubit. So I have UH on the first qubit and I do nothing on the second qubit. So I just put a one or identity on the second qubit. I do nothing to the second qubit. What's going to happen is that zero plus one is going to go to zero or one. And then I could have a polarizing beam splitter or something or stern girl like operator, something that can distinguish between uh, that can make two channels. So I have a P0 channel and I have a P1 channel here. So if this detector clicks with 100% probability, if this detector always clicks, in other words, then my function is constant. And if this detector clicks, then my function is balanced. So I can extend this entire concept to as many qubits as I like. And the general form that of, of, of implementing the Deutsch algorithm for the multi-qubit state remains the same. So I have, so if I were to do the function evaluation on n bits, I would take n qubits, initialize all of them to get zero, take an ancillary qubit, initialize it to the state cat one, do a Hadamard gate on all of them, as I've done in the two qubit case. So here I have a Hadamard gate on both qubits. So I do a Hadamard gate on all the qubits. <clears throat> then I do a function evaluation of the similar kind that I've mentioned. Then I throw away the ancillary qubit because this was just an assistive device. And then I do a Hadamard gate on all the remaining qubits. And if all of them turn out to be zeros in the state zero, or in the, or, and even if one of them turns out to be in the state one, so if all of them turn out to be zero, my function is going to be constant. 
and if any one of them turns out in a state one in fact half of them will turn out in state one then my output is going to be balanced and i can do this in one shot in just one experiment i just need a, a large number of qubits so if i were to do this experiment classically with n bits i would like to find out whether those n bits so i have 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 1 0 and so on so if i have n bits i have two this per n strings and if i had function Function evaluations on these n bits. I would need two rest per n minus one plus one experiments classically. However, quantum mechanically with the quantum computer, I can achieve this only with a single shot with one experiment. And this is where the power of quantum computers lies. And so, in this example, uh, the take-home lessons from this example is that you have a classical problem. You map that classical problem into a quantum problem and design an algorithm for this. you encode your input bits into qubits add an ancillary qubit perhaps do a hadamard gate create a superposition and creating a superposition with the initial hadamard gates is important because it creates all the infinite variety of basis states so you can exploit quantum parallelism then you design your function evaluation and then you perform and you have to perform a measurement at the end and that measurement distinguishes between cat 0 and cat 1 it cannot distinguish between cat 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1 so you have to massage your algorithm in such a way that your measurements can work this is how the general scheme of a quantum computer uh, really 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 works so by this example i just wanted to emphasize or give you an overview or a curtain raiser of how classical problems which are important can be sped up they can be done in a fewer uh, number of experiments or with fewer resources than uh, what is required uh, classically so if you look at this problem from a classical computer science perspective you need if you have n bits you need two bits per n experiments which is exponentially large but here you are solving the same problem with just n qubits which is polynomial you don't need an exponentially large number of qubits and you do the experiment in just a single shot this is where the real power of quantum computers comes in and in the next lecture we'll look at some more examples of uh, entangled state we'll see what is entanglement what is what what is uh, its role in quantum computation and quantum computation uh, information processing and also we'll also we'll also try to uh, discuss or see quantum teleportation all right so i can take one or two uh, questions sorry this lecture has gone a bit overboard Uh, i'm sorry about that but i think these this was an important component of our course we almost halfway through the course so i can take a couple of questions uh, <clears throat> assalam alaikum uh, my name is mediha khalid i have a couple of questions regarding this experiment uh, first of all i wanted to ask that uh, physically if we can imagine n qubit experiment so physically can we imagine that uh, we have n coins simultaneously and we want to check all the coins in one shot that whether they are fair or not is that correct is is my understanding yes. correct yes so uh, so from uh, from a mathematical point of view uh, we can we say that that this experiment is actually a one shot check for a function that is a random number generator Uh, that uh, does it give uh, a balanced random number or not can we say that or can we can we you know uh, implement that this concept in checking of a random number well we're not doing a random number checking here uh, random numbers are really hard to implement we're not doing a random number we are we only make a promise that the function is constant or balanced it's not random there's an order to it so okay. even though coin tosses are random uh, but the promise that we're making is whether the function is constant or balanced and we so need to stick to that promise okay so we're analyzing the function that takes n bits as an input and we are we're checking that whether they give equal number of ones and zeros in, as an output or not no can we say so that so, so if you look at the screen i have zero yes. sequence of zeros and ones and n bits okay so <clears throat> what the function does is that no matter what the string is if i get zero so my mm. output is either zero uh if it's always zero 
or it's always one. Okay. Then my function is constant. But if it's sometimes zero, for some strings it is zero, and sometimes it is one, and half of the times it is zero and half of the times it is one, then my function is balanced. Okay. So okay. this is my promise that is my function f is of, of one of these kinds. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm taking yes, yes. I, I just need the last screen, sorry, screen has stopped working, so I'll just I cannot write anymore. I'll need to restart, but I can take still take questions. I, I just need a comment of yours on one thing. Uh, you just said that uh, a single qubit uh, system is not a complete system. But what's your comment on uh, BB84 security protocol? It's basically a single qubit operation working on a string of inputs. So what's your comment? Uh, isn't it a single qubit operation working no, independently on a number of bits? No, no, no. It, it requires at least two qubits. For BB84, the security protocol, yes. the key exchange yes. protocol. Exactly. Uh, oh. You at least one ancillary qubit. You you can ignore that later on, but that ancillary qubit is essential. Okay. So just like teleportation, teleportation and BB84 are really uh, quite complementary to one another. In teleportation, you are uh, teleporting the state of one qubit, but you need a third qubit for that, and you entangle two qubits. So you need ancillary qubits uh, for. Pro most problems of this kind. A first one qubit quantum computer is indeed quantum mechanical. It, it works on the laws of quantum mechanics like every atomic system, but then you can also simulate it classically. So, so it's a philosophical question whether it is truly quantum or not. Okay, okay. Thank you for the comment. So are you are you getting the gist of of quantum computing or uh, any any feedback mid mid course feedback feel free to speak up any things that I would like you would like me to change for the next four lectures or is it going all right Assalamu uh, Dr. Sadi Welcome Salam uh, my name is Bilal Dilat. I have I just wanted a quick uh, uh, comment from your side uh, yesterday when we implemented the not gate the quantum not gate it was that first of all we did the Hadamard. It was followed by a pi by two, then again a pi by two, and then a Hadamard. So I just wanted to, uh, like, for example, if I create a scenario, a physical scenario that uh, uh, the first pi by two is a pulse, followed by another pi by two. So is my thinking correct in uh, this understanding that it's sort of a Ramsey sequence? Yes. So so we so a quantum interferometer. The example that I gave you two beam splitters, <clears throat> uh, two beam splitters and a pi gate in between, which could be achieved by a phase medium, is a not gate really because cat zero is going into cat one. So, yeah. another way of looking at this, if you were studied atomic physics or uh, you were dealing with atomic system, then this is an atomic Ramsey interferometer. Uh, okay. Exactly. So, if you were an atomic physicist, you would think in terms of Ramsey interferometry. Yes, you're okay. absolutely correct. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. And uh, the other question is just a big, basic question. Can you like uh, shed a light on uh, the differences between the uh, the term quantum computation and quantum information? Because on the internet, there is no direct answer to this. So what's your take on this? Quantum information is a superset and quantum computation is, in, as I view it, is a subset of quantum information. Uh, okay. So when you talk... Quantum information is much bigger. Uh, it, it, it involves communication. You communicate information from one point to another using qubits or photons. Uh, you can communicate with satellites. Then there's the concept of non-locality. Quantum computers, they are the are semantics of quantum computation is determined by uh, classical computers. So quantum computers are really uh, information processes. They take uh, their definition from how we view normal computing. So they do something useful as far as information processing is concerned. But I view quantum information as the big superset and quantum computers as a subset of it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and sir, one comment from my side is that, uh, can you like uh, give us more homeworks for practice or something like, for example, you gave us today. So if you can put up some exercises that will like uh, have more practice on our side. 
I, I will try to uh, put up a problem sheet. Uh, of course, it is uh, voluntary and you can submit your answers yeah. to me and sure. I can give feedback. It's okay. not going to be mandatory because you promised that we're not going to give any more homeworks because everyone is drained at the moment. But I will definitely this week try to put up a homework okay. sheet. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Any last question or any feedback? <clears throat> All right, so with this 20 seconds or 30 seconds rule, uh, I would once again like to thank the Khwarizmi Science Society and I would like to thank all of you once again for sticking through with me and uh, pulling through this course. And I hope there is there, it adds to our understanding of nature and understanding of modern technologies. And inshallah, next week, we'll come up with more interesting ideas, fascinating ideas about entanglement, about teleportation, some more ideas about quantum information, how information can be cloned, whether it can be cloned or not, how can we measure states. We look at non-locality, some of the most weird and eerie concepts of quantum computers. Uh, so we look. Uh, I hope you are also looking at the videos. Uh, they've been uploaded on a private playlist on YouTube by the Khorizmi Society. And inshallah, we'll be in touch next week. Inshallah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And assalamu alaikum and ma salam. <laughs>